I think that if more people would look at their disappointments or their setbacks or what they consider their failures with an idea of, okay, what, what, what does God want me to learn here? We know a lot of people in the business world that are financially well off, but they're very time broke. If you're, if you're more concerned about what people are going to say than your content, then, then you're in the wrong business. That's right. If you've got good content, put it out. Welcome everybody to another episode of the Driven Not Given podcast. And I got to tell you, man, uh, I'm always excited because I, I have the pleasure of having a lot of incredible people in my network. And this gentleman, that would be an understatement. I, I, I actually met this gentleman when I was 18 years old. I just hmm. met him from afar. We never really talked. It was in a, in a company that we were, were both working for, but he was one of the top guys in that company, you know, driving the, the nicest cars and one of the top leaders in the company. Um, we're going to get into that story here shortly. But I've often said in network marketing, for a long time, I would say in network marketing, I was like, for years, I would say, I haven't found somebody. There's people that are better speakers and trainers than me in English. There's people that are better speakers and trainers than me in Spanish but I have not found one that's better than me in both <laughs> until I saw you train in Spanish and present in Spanish. I was like, that man is better than me and stuff. And that's okay, right? We were just talking with Jay earlier here, helping us with the podcast that it's okay to be a copycat as long as you copy the right cat. I love that. So I've got my friend, okay? And he's a mentor. He doesn't, he might not know this, but he's a mentor from afar as well. Okay. Mr. Luis, uh, Dr. Luis Ariasa. How my are man. you, my brother? I am great. Thank you, JC. And congratulations. You know, I, I also have been, you know, thank God for social media. I've been keeping uh, track on you from afar. And uh, and I clearly remember the first time that you said, and I forget it was if it was Facebook or on Instagram, that you were a serial entrepreneur. And right. it's, uh, it's a very tall task, but you've done a great job at it. So, so having this podcast, I am not surprised at all. Thank you very much, my yeah. brother. I appreciate that. And, um, you know, it's, um, you're definitely one of those people that has inspired me for a long time. I mm -hmm. followed your journey, especially in the days of social media, right? Because mm -hmm. when I, when I met you for the first time, social media didn't exist. This mm -hmm. is back in 2001 is when I met you, mm -hmm. when I found out about you really, right? Because, uh, I was just an uh, 18 year old kid getting started. Then I saw Incredible. you and you know, the leadership in that company. I think you were driving a, a Lamborghini at the time. I, I, at the time I had a recently purchased, uh, Mike Tyson's purple Lamborghini. I know it sounds, I know it just sounds crazy, but it was, <laughs> I was one, I was one of the, one of those guys. And, um, yeah, it was a phenomenal experience to drive off the lot in a purple Lamborghini with ivory interior. Yeah. It was a pretty, pretty incredible feeling. That's awesome. And you said it that is, was Mike Tyson's Lamborghini. It was before. Mike Tyson's. It was in consignment at uh, the house of imports in Newport, in Newport beach. And, uh, yeah, I mean, and I want to say something. I'm not that type of guy, you know, I'm, I'm not the Lamborghini. I mean, now I love it. Right. But, yeah, yeah. um, it was, it was just as much a fantasy for me as it would be for a lot of people, right? Sure. People that, that are car enthusiasts, you're car, right. car enthusiasts. Right. Um, and it was just one of those things. And, uh, I always tell people that sometimes it's okay to just do one of those things, right? Just sure. kind of just check it off because there's going to come a time when you're going to be done with all that stuff. And then you can focus on the most important thing like you are right now. That's true. That's true. And, uh, you know, I'm 38 years old now. 38 years young. 38 years young. That's, that's right. right. <laughs> 38 years young. I feel very young, you know. You I, are. You're I, very I think young. I, thank you. And I think I've done a good job of just kind of, you know, taking care of myself, good products and whatnot, sure. a lot of water working out and whatnot. And so, but I, I've listened and thanks to the day and age that we live in with the podcast, I get to learn from people on the internet. I get to learn mm. people from you, right? I believe that this day and age is kind of silly not to grow, right? Because all the information is out there. Absolutely. Now, but to get back to you, uh, you started off your, your, you know, you were a, a chiropractor. You are a chiropractor. I am. I'm Can a you tell me about how you got started and how you did as a chiropractor and then your transition from that into the business world? Sure. So, uh, my parents were born and raised in El Salvador. They came to the United States about about 60, 61 years ago. And uh, we were born, I was born and raised in South Central. I think you may be familiar with yep. South Central yes, a little bit. definitely. A very, very difficult area. So my upbringing, I, I, like I tell people, I wish that I could say that it was beautiful and empowering and positive and filled with abundance, but it was opposite of that. I mean, right. I, I knew my mom and dad loved me, but it was very scarce. 
my dad was a functional alcoholic. Um, so we had that type of lifestyle, right? right? My mother, like many traditional Latina women, uh, tolerated and tolerated and tolerated. So at a very young age, I realized that um, I realized what I didn't want. Okay. Right? I didn't want to live in a impoverished environment. I didn't want to have that type of stress and anxiety in my home. So um, I wanted to be an attorney. At the age okay. of 10, 11 years old, I wanted to be an attorney. And when I was in, in, in high school, a freshman, a cathedral high school, uh, we had career day. Okay. And this attorney came in. So I was super excited, sitting in the front row. And he came in, he was, he was late. He was, nothing wrong being out of shape, but he was massively, massively overweight. He had a big polyester red tie with a big stain. He was perspiring. Oh. Yeah, just like that. And I was sitting in the front. <laughs> and I, earlier, you and I were, sitting, we were talking about this. And I thought, that's not what I want to feel like or look like 20, 30 years from right. now. So I came home, told my mom, I'm not going to be an attorney anymore. A couple years later, she invited me to go to a chiropractor because I have been seeing chiropractors for all their lives. And a chiropractor in Southgate. Dr. Raul Moreno, I haven't seen him in about 30 years. Wow. Uh, she went in there, very simple Latino chiropractor. And I was just, I was sitting in the lobby and I remember how people would walk in and when they would walk out, maybe their phys physicality was the same, but they just looked different. Yeah. They, they, they were True. giving a different energy. And I got in back in the car with my parents and I said, that's it. I want to make people feel like he is. And they're like, that. well, but you don't know what it is. I said, it doesn't matter. I, I want to make people, I want to empower people the way he's empowering mm. people. So at and the age, I'm sorry, how old were you? I was 15. Okay, got it. So at the age of 15, I decided I wanted to become a chiropractor. I went to uh, Cerritos Community College. Yeah. And Me too. You, did you really? Mm -hmm. UCLA, University of Cerritos, La <laughs> <Exactly. Lepa> Alondra. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, um, and my counselor was a chiropractor. So God always had these people that were, you know, so the, the, my counselor put me on the path to take my prerequisites. I took my entrance exam at the age of 19 okay. and I was admitted. And so I went in, got my bachelor's and my chiropractic degree and I graduated, graduated 24 years old. I was excited. I was pumped. You know, they promised us that we'd have a great life. Yeah. Um, what I realized though, is that I still had a very, very scarce mentality. Yeah. Right. So different than other people when they pray for like wealth and they pray for ambition, I prayed for somebody to come into my life that had what I was missing. And God placed this person in my life. And wow. I'm 52 today. I've been mentored for 28 years. And that's when he placed my first mentor in my life at the age of 24, who was also a chiropractor. Got it. And he taught me what I talk about today. He taught me the philosophy, science, and art of having a fulfilling life. Okay. And uh, there were 33 principles in this process. So being a good student, I did everything he told me to do. Everything he told me to do. He worked on my, on my thought process. He worked on my paradigms. He really, he changed me from above down, inside out. And I don't mm. know if you saw my, my, uh, my website, but I we did. talk about that yep. ADIO mm -hmm. principle. I was gonna ask you what that yeah. is. Yeah, and he, t he changed me from above down, inside out. And uh, things worked well. I married the woman of my dreams, been married for almost 24 years. At the, and I say this very humbly, um, at the age of 28, we, we made our first million in business as chiropractors. As chiropractors. We opened up seven health centers from Long Beach to, to Fontana. Wow. All in Latino areas. And um, something changed for me when I was 30 years old, which I, I'm positive the same thing happened to you because I follow you on social media. Yeah. Uh, when I was 30, um, my first son was born. Yeah. That radically changed my entire life. Yeah. And I just felt like, like I felt God just pull that desire to go and put in 80 hours a week in my office and just grind it out. Yeah. I, we were, we were in our office all the time. I didn't want to do that. Right. I wanted to be at home with my wife. I wanted to be at home with my child. Yep. I wanted to be as you are a present father mm -hmm. and but we had a great life we had yeah. a very lucrative life so at that moment i prayed again and uh, um i came across network marketing through serendipity i was at the balm park balm park uh, marriott got that, it yeah you probably oh, definitely presented many times there uh -huh. 
I was walking to my car and I saw this very exotic car parked right in front. Now, Baldwin Park is, a, is not a high socioeconomic area. Right. So I went back to the concierge. I said, who drives that car? Because I wanted, I'm, I'm wondering, why is that car here in Baldwin Park? Right. So then um, she said, so he's in the room. I entered the room. I sat in the back. Didn't know what it was. I heard the gentleman speak. I came up to him, Asian man, gave him my card, because at the time I was getting to the speaking industry. We met for a two hour meeting, it was supposed to be a two hour meeting. I walk out seven hours later and he told me the entire philosophy, science and art of network marketing, multi-level marketing. I came home, I said, "Hun, we're gonna become professional network marketers. <laughs> and we both were like, you know, this sounds kind of crazy. We had a phenomenal flourishing business, right. seven health centers, many people employed. The only thing that we didn't have was our time. Right. And now we have a baby boy. So at the age of 31, we took a huge Cairo, so a huge leap of faith and began to study network marketing different than other people. We, we didn't just jump in and start moving products. We actually studied it as a, as a profession. Mm. Because in my mind, I thought, if I'm going to give up my profession as right. a chiropractor that I studied for seven, eight years and invested a lot of money into it, um, I'm going to treat this as a profession, right? Right. And, and we did. And thank God that, you know, God put some very powerful network marketers in my life at a very young age. And we've been doing network marketing for the last 30, for the last 21 years. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. You know, it, and somebody like you, right, with your background, not only being a chiropractor, is your wife a chiropractor too? Is, is no, I call her an honorary chiropractor. Got it. She knows more chiropractic than most other people, most <laughs> chiropractors, yeah. Got no, it. She's not. She, she has a, uh, she has a uh, degree in international business from uh, Azusa Pacific University. Nice. She is phenomenal. She is one of the most you amazing. You recruited up. <laughs> I, I, God is good. God That's is right. good. I, <laughs> I definitely, I recruited way out of my need. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. That's what we have in common, I, that's, man. What I'm saying, yeah. right. that's right. That's right. That's right. No, that's awesome. I recruited awesome. way out of my league. And so for somebody like you, right, successful business owner, chiropractor, multiple offices and, and, yeah. and a lot of employees to go into the network marketing world yes. and no surprise that you were successful. But also, it also adds a tremendous amount of credibility to the industry because it's a very misunderstood industry. Absolutely. Right. So for somebody of your caliber with that level of success to go, mm -hmm. because that's a very real thing, the time freedom. You know, we, we know a lot of people in the business world that are very financially well off, but they're very time broke. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you found the ability. So now your life, I mean, I've been to your house, man. I've had the good fortune to go to your house and spend some time with you a few times and you have a beautiful house, you have a beautiful family, but more importantly is also, or, or just as important as that is, the fact that you've got that time freedom. Mm -hmm. Like every time I see you, you never look stressed or in a hurry. <laughs> you, you understand? And I'm sure, and I know you're productive though, yeah, that's the yes, thing. Yes, yes, yes. And so, how important is it for somebody, of course, you know, the industries for some people is not for everybody, but one of the key things that you just said right now is that you got a mentor, right? Yeah. You've had a few mentors in your life. Three. What is the importance of a good mentor? Because I think that's something that in the industry of network marketing, we talk about that a lot. Mm -hmm. But outside of the industry, I don't. I hear it a little bit more now in the mm -hmm. social media world. Yeah. But not, so, how important would you say that is to somebody? Sure. So you know, we have um, when 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 a, when a person's born, right? So so so. Um, if I can elaborate just a yes. little bit, yeah. It, when someone's born, um, their mind has no filter. Okay, so, so therefore, everything that we, everything through our five senses, everything that we see, feel, taste, touch, hear, becomes real. Right. Okay, and it, and it's embedded. It's embedded. It's embedded, and it happens for seven years. So your son is five, six, six. Okay, so for for six years, everything that Max, mm -hmm. everything that Max has seen and heard and felt and smelt and tasted has become part of his being, everything. Right. Now, you and your wife are great parents. Um, unfortunately, many, par many parents are trying to just stay alive. They're right. trying to just stay above water. Right. So they're not thinking, oh, you know, I can't show my stress when I get home mm -hmm. because Susie is three and she'll feel the stress. They're not, they're just trying to pay the bills. Right. They're just trying to get by. So therefore, all these things come into, and at the age of seven, something happens neurologically. And what happens is that a filter 
is developed. And now we have what's called the conscious and the subconscious, right? So, so now the, the conscious mind tells you at max, and then I'm sure he, he, is, he can do it now, but by seven, Max is gonna know you don't run in the street. Right. Max is gonna know, hey, if that's not yours, don't touch it. Mm -hmm. Max is gonna know that's hot, don't you you can get burned. At the age of two or three, Max doesn't know that. Correct. At the age of two or three, if Max walks right about here and he sees a liquid, he may want to drink it because it's all subconscious, right? So right. so now now we have our conscious mind which tells us right is wrong, true or false, but we have our subconscious mind that really we we don't live, JC, and I know you know this. We don't live from what we know. We live from what we feel. Mm. The point being, my father was an alcoholic for 25 years. Mine was too, yeah. If you ask him at any point, is alcohol wrong? He would say yes, but he continued drinking. Got it. Because they don't do what they know. That, that person that's 200 pounds overweight, if you ask them that, you know, that the Twinkies, Twinkies or Ding Dongs are bad for you, they'll say yes. That, that husband who verbally abuses his wife, do you think you should disre disrespect her like that? You'd say no. So, you, so we know, but we don't function from what right. we know. We, we function from what's called our paradigms, right? Mm, our conditionings, powerful. right? So as my mentor would tell me, we're born to win and conditioned to lose. So we're conditioned, 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 and we just stray away so much from our God-given ability, from our God-given potential. So therefore, there's only two ways to reprogram ourselves, right? One way is through hypnosis, which is something totally different, but another way is through repetition. Hmm. Okay, and you know, Tony Robbins yep. always says repetition is mother's success. Right. Repetition precedes mastery. So, to answer your question, a mentor to me were two people in my life that helped to reprogram my DNA. Hmm. There were two people in my life that it didn't happen overnight. Remember, I my first mentor, I was with him for 19 years. It was my first call every morning and my last call every evening, seven days a week. JC, whatever he told wow. me to do, I did, okay? Because wow. I knew, I believed that the lifestyle that he had, I didn't want what he had. It was the lifestyle, the time freedom, the right. connection. You know, the Bible says God is not a respecter of people. So if he can have it, I could too. That's right. If I change my thought process. Right. Right. So therefore, a mentor to me is someone that was able to help me change my thought process and therefore help me change my results. Hmm. If I can just share this one thing with you. Sure. Um, uh, Dr. Joe, Joe Dispenza talks about this a lot. So, so your paradigms create your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts is what gives birth to your beliefs. Your beliefs creates your decisions, your decisions create your experiences, your experiences create your emotions, and your emotions come back and fuel your thoughts. So therefore, if I wanted to if I wanted to have different experiences, I can't just go out there and work harder. You've seen people in network marketing that work, 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 and don't get the results right. you get. You see people in network marketing go to all these presentations and don't get the results you get because it's not the work, it's the philosophy. It's a right. thought process. Right. In life, you and I, you know, we don't get what we need, we get what we deserve coming from our thought process. Right. So to me, a mentor is somebody that changes your DNA, that changes your belief system, changes your thought process, and really gives what I think is the most important thing, JC, and that is a sense of awareness. Hmm. Because uh, my mentors right. gave me the ability to think what to think about what I'm thinking about. They gave yes. me the ability to become more aware. Right. And if I'm in awareness, then I'm I can appreciate you more. If yes. I'm in awareness, I can sit in front of my meal that I'm gonna have with my family and I can thank God for this meal versus just grubbing it like right. maybe we did before, right? That's right. If I'm in awareness, you know I, you and I we've made money and we've mm -hmm. lost money mm -hmm. and we've made money. Yep. But prosperity feels different now right. because there's a higher level of awareness. That's right. Coming home and hugging your wife and kids feels different now because there's a higher form of yes. awareness. Stephen Covey always says, he says, success is starting at point A, going all the way around, coming back to where you started, but recognizing it for the first time, mm. you know? And and that's that's the power of a mentor. Wow, powerful. When you mention about being aware and, for example, uh, my family and I are sunny, six years old. We have another one on the way. We have congratulations. The, thank I you. Saw that. Yeah. 
We have the great Maximus, uh-huh. and then the next baby is called Alexander the Great. Wow. You know what I'm saying? So Boys? To another boy, yeah. Wow. I tell my wife, another Rico Suave coming into the world. <laughs> she hates she hates that name. Yeah. Because some of my friends used to call me that as a joke when we were dating. So she hates that name. But anyways, but uh, when you mentioned about a mentor, that you first thing you did is talk to him in the morning. Yes. And then last call you made was talking to him at night. Yes. I had a similar relationship like that with uh, one of my mentors who mm-hmm. I'm going to have on the podcast soon as well. Jay Nolan, you may have heard of him. Mm-hmm. I sure did. And so I remember he tells me, JC, you are not to have a comfortable, you're not even to have a living room set mm-hmm. and you're not to have a TV mm-hmm. until you're making 20 grand a month residual income for <laughs> six months in a row. It's intense. If you don't make, if, if you skip one month, if a month six, you don't make it. You start over. Okay. And I listened to him. And, oh, and he said, and by the way, you shouldn't have a girlfriend either. <laughs> I was like, well, at the time I had a girlfriend in Las Vegas. I said, I have a girlfriend in Las Vegas. He says, if you didn't have a girlfriend, I will tell you not to have a girlfriend. But, I mean, he was intense, man. Yeah. The thing is that with me, he was very intense, but what helped me out is the martial arts background that I had. Because my karate mm-hmm. teacher, that's one of the things you and I have in common. Mm-hmm. That was one of the cool things about when I met you. I'm like, oh my God. And we're going to get into that story here shortly. Mm -hmm. He was very tough on me. So Mm -hmm. one of the things that got me, I grew up on in Southgate, Mm -hmm. but it was on Alameda and 92nd Street. Okay. So if you cross the train tracks, now there's a big wall there. But Mm -hmm. back then the wall wasn't there. If you cross the train tracks, you're in Watts. Mm -hmm. And if you stay on this side, you're in Southgate. So it's borderline. Mm -hmm. So needless to say, it wasn't the best neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But martial arts and having a mentor, because that was my first mentor, really, Mm -hmm. right? It was my mom. And then him, right? Mm -hmm. And he was also a father figure to me. So he was an intense karate teacher. Mm. But that helped me develop Mm -hmm. that mindset. Absolutely. Right? So then when I got into the business world and I had mentors from afar and then I Mm -hmm. had mentors that I work with, I I was gravitated to the mentors that didn't sugarcoat things. I said, Mm -hmm. tell me what I need to know because I got to be successful. At the age Mm -hmm. of 18, I made a goal to retire my mom by the age of 30. Wow. And that happened by 28 to this day, 10 years. Thank you. And so, so one of the cool things about you is that when we started talking about how you mentioned that your kids, you know, did karate and stuff and whatnot, turns out that we had the same karate teacher. Incredible. Jose Pacheco. Absolutely. Tell me about the impact that that had on your kids, right? Because part of this podcast is also, I want it to also give value Mm -hmm. because there's a lot of kids out there, Mm -hmm. you know, teenage years, Mm -hmm. young adults that they don't have guidance. But nowadays, thanks to the internet and thanks to podcasts like this, they could hear because peer pressure is a very real thing. Mm -hmm. And so tell me about how the the martial arts helped your kids out growing up. Sure, sure. So so we were at uh, Faith Community with Pastor Jim Reeves. At, uh, at a Halloween festival and uh, we walk by and we see this little girl doing karate and she was really, really good. It was Japanese Shotokan, so she nice. was doing some kicks. I had put my son in, in T-ball and just bored to death. Mm-hmm. Nothing wrong with T-ball, just for him <laughs> it was boring. Right. And, um, and so we said, let's try karate, right? And we took him and they would call him, when he was four, they would call him the wiggle and jiggle. <laughs> uh, I see Max sometimes you're yeah. like San Jose, San Jose, you know? that's right, right. it's like the wiggle and jiggle because it's all no no foundation right right and I just thought no big deal it's sure. you know I'll bring him once or twice a week and yeah. you know just like all parents it's like, most kids go through karate at some point that's in their right. lives right that's right but then something happened and it just, like like it, something clicked and he started to get better and he started to be more excited going to karate right and and we're like, okay, so let's let's kind of feed this endeavor. Let's kind of feed this passion a little bit. And uh, our sensei, Sensei Carlos, he says, you know what? Let's put him in a tournament. I'm, I, I know nothing. I'm like, okay, I don't know. If, if you think he's ready, he's ready. Well, he did a, a kata at a tournament, and he won second place. Okay. And he got a trophy. And... You know, you know how it is. Yes. People work for money, but they die for recognition. Yes, it was recognition at the at the age of five that was just overwhelming to him. Yeah. And he 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 put that trophy in his room, <laughs> and he would show it to be. And my wife and I were equally as proud of him yes. for doing that because we never went into it thinking, you know, you you have tremendous martial art background. We we didn't. We just we just did it because there was that's sure. what we do, right? And so. So he started getting more into it, more into it. So, so then uh, the, our, our, our dojo said, 
where we're going to go to a big tournament and we want you to put him in sparring. Right. He had done a little sparring, but I'm like, you know, if you guys think so. <laughs> so we were in Vegas and they were in this octagon. He was five. And the sensei wasn't there at that moment. But being a fanatical dad, I said, well, I'll coach him through it. They're five. How, how bad could this be? Yeah. And he's looking at me. But I made him look at me because his opponent and his opponent, I just realized this, his opponent was named Max. Interesting. His opponent was his little boy from Mexico. Okay. That was extraordinary. Wow. And he was putting his kicks and doing all this stuff. And I'm, I'm, he, my son is looking at me. His name's Fabian. He's looking at me. I'm looking over his shoulder and I'm thinking, this boy is going to destroy <laughs> Fabian. And oh, I'm man. looking for the sensei thinking, maybe we're in the wrong category. Maybe he's wrong, in the wrong belt. You know what I mean? It's like, maybe he's fighting the wrong belt. He was right. like a yellow belt. Maybe this kid is a blue or brown belt. And he's, the referee's like, are you ready? I said, I, sure, I guess so, right? He's all right. He brought them both together. He said, you know, what is that word that say? Uh, Kumite. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. And, and they start, and this little, his, Max just destroyed him. My son comes, I don't know how he learned to call a timeout. He comes and he's running to me and he's like, he's crying. He's like, dad, stop the fight. I said, son, are you hurt? I'm not hurt. I said, son. Are, are you bleeding? I'm not bleeding. I said, son, I, I'm not going to stop the fight, son. Son, it doesn't matter if you run around for three minutes. Right. But I can't finish. stop the fight. Right. I can't. So he ran, literally ran around for three minutes. He quit. I mean, he, he, the fight ended. Obviously, he lost. We're walking back. Parents from the dojo are so mad at me because they're like, how, how, why would you allow your son to go through that? And one dad in particular stopped me as I was, as I was exiting the, the arena. He said, why didn't you stop the fight? Why, you have the towel. Why didn't you throw in the towel? I said, because my son was in the middle of a very heightened level of emotion. And if I throw in the towel, I'm going to create a neurological association that when things get really difficult, he can quit. I said, and right. I'm not going to raise a quitter. I'm not, right. I, would, I would rather him. He wasn't getting beat up. He wasn't like devastating. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're five years old. Right, right. I said, I'd rather him get his feelings hurt than me contribute to an attitude of a quitter. Right. I said, I will never do that. Hmm. And on the way home, my wife said, you have to find the best instructor around. And we started asking around and we came across this man by the name of Master Pacheco, Jose That's right. Pacheco, That's right. who was your, your, one of your teachers, I, I right. believe. And Master Pacheco came in and he started training Fabian three days a week. Non private stop. classes. Private classes. Got it. And he was very, very strict, as you know. Yep. He accepted no shortcuts. Uh, I'd say the first six months, there wasn't a training that Fabian didn't cry. There wow. wasn't one training that Fabian didn't cry, whether it was because, uh, you know, he expected too much physically or because he was getting beat up or because he'd bring kids from Southgate. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. and kids that are <laughs> that are brawlers, right? Yeah, yeah. And he says he's he cuz he I he told me at the very beginning, "What do you want?" I said, "I want you to make him a champion." Right. So every time things get a little difficult, he look at me and says, "You want a champion, right?" That's right. I said, "That's what we signed up for, right?" And um when he was 8, when he was 8, he won he he fought 83 times, he went 79 and 4, and he when he was 9, he went 84 and 1. And one of those fights, he met up with Max now like three years later. Really? And it was so, too bad social media wasn't around back right, then. Right, right. That, that little dojo area, it was jam-packed because people knew by this time Fabian had done a lot of winning. Max kept winning. So it was, it was like, it was Muhammad Ali and, and Frazier. Right, it was that. Right. And it was an awesome fight. Fabian won. And it was, you know, what, what Fabian took wow. away and what we took away was um, confidence, yep. uh, discipline, discipline, character, you know, the, the mindset of saying you're going to start something and being not just a strong starter, but a strong finisher. Right. But of all those things, um, JC, it, it's that, that confidence that he built with himself that he carried into other things. And that discipline of mind, I was just talking to a, a group of my, my, my organization this morning, I said, one of the greatest problems with people is they have poorly disciplined thoughts, hmm. right? 
Jim Rohn, True. one of our mentors, yep. he says, always stand guard at the door of your mind. Don't That's don't right. allow things to enter your mind that are not going to be favorable and prosperous and productive and yep. helpful because everything grows roots, right? And That's so right. that is that is that is something that that my son and us took away from Master Pacheco and I, just our experience with martial arts is that some they're 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 character building elements Big in time. martial arts that you you carry them now yep. you know many years later yep. you still carry yep. those into your business world you carry them into your marriage mm -hmm. you carry them into raising your children right and although fabian doesn't do martial arts anymore he still has that thought process yes. because he did it for eight nine years three hours a day six days a week that's right so it's part of his personality now yes so yeah martial arts was very wow. effective for us you know what i i can attest to that and and how old do you think you were when when you hired Pacheco to train your son approximately he was five so that's 15 years ago uh, that would make me 37 what's interesting is that my son does jiu-jitsu and I train him kickboxing and boxing and karate and he's in jiu-jitsu and he's doing good he's got his white belt with the gray stripe and he's got a couple of stripes on it so he's very soon going to the next color belt I love it. he already got advanced one now he's going to but <clears throat> I've got a, I've got friends that do MMA one of my buddies Matthew Spencer, shout out to Matthew Spencer. Um, he's a MMA fighter and he's also, you know, he, he's a trainer. So I just reached out to him a couple of weeks ago. I said, hey, I need to hire you to come and train my son because he needs to learn the wrestling side on how to take kids down, mm. right? So like, yeah, he's, and not only that, just he's also, my, my buddy's, uh, he's not a black belt, but he's high up there. He's sure. a very good jujitsu practitioner as well. So I want to take it to that next level because Maximus likes it. I'm not going to force him to do something he doesn't like, but I am going to force him to champion up when it's time to champion up, right? right. Like you just said about your son. It's not like he was getting beat up. It wasn't like a scene from Rocky. You know <laughs> yeah, what I'm no, saying? There was no blood. Right, right. Yeah, yeah it, it's fear and stuff, and it does help you. One of the things with me is when I would compete as a kid, my parents, could, my mom could never go, mm -hmm. right? Because I was raised with a single mother. And so when I would win, it was awesome. I had nobody to really go celebrate to other than the people that were with me. But mm. when I would lose, a lot of kids would go to their parents and parents would say, hey, that's right. okay. And I didn't have that. So right. I had to learn how to discipline my disappointment, right? Mm. Like, like mm -hmm. Jim Rohn teaches. And that's that good. many years later is when I realized, no wonder when I've lost big, I just said, hey, man. Let's just start over. That's right. What's the point of crying about it? Mm. Crying about it and dwelling on this is not going to get me to where I need to go. Mm. Let's go. And I just realized that that I've been shaped that way, mm -hmm. just like you, just like your son, mm -hmm. to, hey, man, this is just how it is. And you're not, oh, so, you know, I heard a, a, a quote once that says, sometimes you're the statue that everybody's admiring. Sometimes you're the pigeon and nobody <laughs> notices, right? <laughs> and what's interesting, right, it, it's true. What's interesting is that a couple of years ago, Two and a half, three years ago, I was doing very well. And then a lot of bad luck happened. Lost a lot of money, just a bunch. Then I realized not only are, I didn't really ask for a whole lot of help, but n people stopped to really believe in me. Mm -hmm. Almost like they thought I couldn't do it. I had to look at myself in the mirror. And I said mm -hmm. this on the last podcast mm -hmm. and say, you're still JCF and Rangel, mm -hmm. right? It was one of those conversations. Like you've done it before. You could do it again. It's like mm -hmm. riding a bike. Right. And so, mm -hmm. hey, let's keep going and yeah. let's make it happen. Tell me about a time because I know you've gone and you mentioned it earlier, doing well, losing it. Tell mm -hmm. them, tell me about one of those tough times in your life where, you, where, where things look bleak and stuff and you got over it. Sure. You know, um, um, God has been incredibly generous to us in all aspects of life. That's awesome. From our health to our family to the love of our of our my wife and I to to just a lot of things right and I firmly believe that sometimes God whispers and if you don't listen he starts to yell mm. and that's when things happen that may not have to happen but they happen because we need to learn right so nine years ago uh, we went through our toughest time in business we lost everything we lost our homes, our investments, our cars. We went through foreclosure, repossessions. Wow. We went through everything, right? Um, if someone asks me, why, if, some, if someone would ask me why nine years ago, I would have said, oh, because of that and that and that and that, right? But the reality is that, you know, I have to assume, you know, if, if you want all the fame, you got to have all the, all the blame too, yeah. right? So 
I, I, my pastor helped me with this because I fell into maybe like a month, two months of a quasi depression, like, like you, you know, where people are like, I don't know if you can do this again. Right. You know, I, I don't know if you can, if you can build it again because we have built something phenomenal. And at that moment, my, I, I met with my pastor and he's like, um, he's like, what do you think? I said, you know, I just have this issue with these people that, that, that made these things that put us in this situation. And he said, what about you? I said, I said, no, pastor, I didn't. He said, well, there, it can't be that they're a hundred percent. I said, he said, what, what decisions could you have maybe made? What things could you have done or not done? And then he really started making me do like an inventory of, of who I was. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what? I, I could have done this. I could have done that. He says, the minute that you assume responsibility, you assume the power to change. Mm -hmm. Most people don't change because they're just not, they, they always think, it, oh, my life is miserable because my mom, because my wife, because my brother, my sister, because of COVID, because of the president. Mm -hmm. what? So they will never, ever change. Right. And so I walked out of there just like so uplifted and we started, we started to, to build again, right? And, and just a story, at, at my lowest moment, I was doing what's called a one-on-one, -on -one, right? I was at Panera Bread. Yeah. And I was in my car. And if, if someone has never had their car repossessed, you won't know. But if you have, you know, <laughs> that, have. You, you know that you're parking it in very, very creative places, <laughs> right? As, as right. you're trying not to have your car repossessed. <laughs> and uh, I was there. And I had forgotten because I wanted to sign this person up. And I did my presentation. Now we're going to talk about the compensation plan. This is nine, ten years ago. <laughs> and um, the lady girl walks in. She's like, who has a black Escalade? And I'm like looking around waiting for someone to say, I had one. No one. Re and she's like, you know, she kind of said it louder, right? She's like, who has a black Escalade? And I'm like, well, I, I do. She's like. And I could just see in her face, she says, you need to go out right now. Right now, you need to go. And I knew it. So wow. I, I ran out. The guy repossessed my car was already in my car, driving away. My youngest son was like one year old. So we had, we had a car seat. Oh. So I yelled at him. I said, please, at least give me my car seat. And the guy, the guy, I don't even recall if he stopped. I don't know how he got it. And he threw it out the window. Wow. Okay. I don't blame him. That's on me. Right. That's my bad decisions. Right. That's my whatever lack of discipline or lack of vision. That, that's he's doing his job. Yes. Right. Yes. So I turn around and like, the guy I'm doing a one on one with is standing outside. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he's man. looking at me. <laughs> and I got home and I got on my knees and I said, this will never happen to me again. That was nine years ago, and uh, nine, in nine years, we've built, it's like the Book of Job, we've built it back up, better, bigger, but with a lot more wisdom and a lot more right. awareness. Right. Um, things just seem different, you know, yes. things just, things are different, things seem, things seem different, but I'll tell you, that was one of the best, that was my best business experience. My biggest loss wow. was my best business is the, makes sense uh, experience yeah and like you said you have to discipline your disappointment yeah you know i think that if more people would look at their disappointments or their setbacks or what they consider their failures with an idea of okay what what, what does god want me to learn here mm. you know what i mean mm. what, what is it that what is it you know i have like you I, I have an amazing relationship and and i have an amazing wife and i have three beautiful boys but every night I, I ask God to make me a better husband, make me a better father. I, I want to, I want to learn what it is to be a spectacular father and, and husband. And, That's awesome. and that just comes through, through, through setbacks and challenges. I, I think that comes through setbacks and challenges, but also a big, and this is why you do it. When you ask our creator, when you ask God for this, 
he will give it to you, right? Absolutely. We, we have not because we ask not, right? Absolutely. And so, no, no, no. I, I, one of the things that I learned a long time ago, from matter of fact, a, a mutual friend of ours, Chepe. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Chepe, man. <laughs> yeah, I've known this guy for a long time. That's cool. So he said, uh, you know, he told me about King Solomon. Mm -hmm. He says, because he asked for wisdom, mm -hmm. God says, I'm going to give you more than wisdom, right? Yeah. And so I started to ask God for, in these days, I ask for God for wisdom and discernment, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I think we're in some crazy times, so I ask for wisdom and discernment. I think that's very important stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, too, ask about being a better father and whatnot. And I've had the cars repossessed and stuff. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, it's not a fun thing, man. I remember one time <laughs> I heard my very first, for those of you guys that know me, I had a red Corvette convertible, mm -hmm. okay, a long time ago. And that car got repossessed. If you wonder what happened, like, I said it. I said it. I sold it. I didn't sell it. It got repossessed. I'm, I'm mature enough to admit it now. And, and honestly, here's the thing, though. I sold it. Yeah, I sold it. Oh, I got rid of that car, man. That was too old for me, man. I had to upgrade, <laughs> right? But no, I went without a car for a couple of months. But nowadays, though, things like that, <clears throat> it makes you more relatable. Right. Yes. I tell people, look, yes. man, you're going to yes. go. I tell my sales organization, you're going to go mm. through tough times. And one day you're going to wish that you went through more of them. Yes. Because if, 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 if it really was easy for you, oh, yeah, I got started in this business. Everybody said yes to me and everybody bought from me and yeah. I got no rejection. Who are you going to be relatable to? Yeah, that person, that, that, that's an unrealistic, unrealistic uh, process there. That doesn't exist. That's yeah. right. You yeah. know? And so, no, no, I, I completely can relate to you. And, Here's a question I like to ask in all of my guests. Go back in time, whether your teenage years, you know, your, your young adult years, what advice would you give to the Louis, Luis Ariasa from back then, right? Because we've got some people that, you know, we've got teenagers watching this, we've got young adults, and we've got people from all different backgrounds mm -hmm. and ages. What advice would you give yourself to your younger self, especially if you could think mm -hmm. of your teenage years? Because I, I have some specific advice that I would give my 14 year old self, my 16 year old self right around there. Right. Also my 18 and 21 year old self, mm -hmm. what advice would you give yourself? Sure. Um, you know, there's, um, there's a, uh, an Eastern philosopher, his name is Jay Krishnamurti. And he said, um, don't, don't, don't be too hard on yourself. Don't beat yourself up. I think that, um, you know, you're, you're a, a very well-spoken entrepreneur, you you know how to how to make money you know how to serve people you know how to help people that didn't happen overnight right it was a process right and i think what people have to do and i'm preaching to myself is trust the process mm. you know um understand that there's going to be a first day for everyone right yes you walk into you walk into a, a 15 million dollar studio a 20 million dollar studio that, that, that dream didn't happen yesterday. Correct. That's years and years and years of really cultivating an idea, you know, spreading it to people that believe in you, uh, letting them spread it, and then, and then doing things and, and really allowing the universe to align people in situations so you can make that happen. I think that for the best advice or one of the, the key advices that I would give, uh, on Monday I went back to doing presentations because Yes. You know, COVID has lifted up a little bit, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. whatever your perspective on COVID is. And um, we said, let's, let's, let's do a presentation. We had about 60, 70 people. Nice. It was a good, good room, good sized room. There were plenty of guests. And at the end, I always answer questions, personally answer questions. And there was this kid that, that walked up to me, 18 years old. And he said, um, he says, you know, I'm interested in the product, but I'm more interested in you. He said, how can I be successful that's he asked me that question he said how can i chase my dream and i said well i said i don't really feel like i'm chasing my dream i feel more like i'm fulfilling my purpose because mm. chasing a dream you're you when you're chasing something it's almost like the, the what you're chasing seems to move away from you that's right. why you're chasing it but fulfilling your purpose is more like a divine design fulfilling your purpose is more of a calling I said, what, what is it that you, what is it that makes you passionate? What is it that you can do to two, three o'clock in the morning and wake up at six o'clock and continue, you know, burning the candle both ends? He said, um, gaming. I said, okay, cool. And, and he says, I said, and you want to monetize gaming? He said, yes. I said, wonderful. Monetize gaming. Mm -hmm. I said, go home tonight and monetize gaming. Are you good at gaming? He says, yes. 
then put a little camera and go on YouTube and monetize it. Yeah. He said, but I can't. I said, why? He says, because I live in a two bedroom home. I have three siblings for with him is four mom and dad, uh, uncle and Thea, you know, traditional, yeah. typical Latino yeah. family. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He says, so there's always noise. I said, brother, I said, that's how it is for all of us. That's right. So if you're gaming and you're telling your brother, Victor, hey, stop talking. Everyone has a brother or cousin named Victor. You know what I mean? Right, right. If you're gaming and your uh, and your grandma, you know, wants to make her coffee and she's rattling the pans. Who doesn't have a grandma? I said, that's how life is. That's right. You think you're going to, you know, build this, you know, $100,000 studio. Then you're going to game. I said, that moment's never going to come. Nope. I said, go on, just take a swing. He said, what if no one joins? No one's supposed to join. You, you, no one knows you. Yeah. The first time that I gave my, pre the, my first presentation, I had one person there. Right. My first chiropractic care class, I had one guest there. That's right. I was trembling. I didn't know what to say. I read out of a book for an hour because I didn't have the words. Wow. But it's 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 the first day for everybody. Oh, so right. what would I tell people, myself? Take a swing. That's right. Don't worry about it. So many people, we live in the social media age. Uh, so many people are so concerned with the likes and this and mm -hmm. that. Just put your content. I love what Gary Vee says. If you're if you're more concerned about what people are gonna say than your content, then then you're in the wrong business. That's right. If you've got good content, put it out. You know, you just started this, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Five years from now, you may have 10, 20 million viewers, right? Right, right. That, but you, you started it with whoever's going to join is going to join. Yep. Whoever's going to like is going to like it. And you're going to appeal to a large group of people that, that have your philosophy right. and have your thought process. But I'm positive that when you started this, driven, not given, you weren't thinking, oh, I wonder how many people are going to like it. No, you like it. I like it. And you believe in it. I'm going to take a shot at it. And so people will too. Trust people the process. Ask, you know, when people ask me about a sales organization, growing a big team, or having a large following, let's say for this podcast or whatever. I, for sales organizations, I tell people, when I started, the biggest team I've ever built in network marketing is 120,000 people, Huge. right? And I said, but at one point it was one. Right. It was me. Right. right. <laughs> but I knew I, I'm doing this to be successful. That means mm -hmm. I'm going to have a big organization. Now, where are those people going to come from? The answer is wherever they're at right now. Mm -hmm. That's none of my business. What is my business is to do the fundamentals consistently and persistently mm. and not stop. I believe mm. that. Mm -hmm. I, I learned this. I forgot who I learned this from. I think it was Rick Roberry. He says to me, he's a good friend of mine. He says, two reasons why people don't get what they want. They're not doing something right or they're not doing it often enough. So I just figured sure. with this podcast, for example, I'm going to just keep shooting. I'm going to mm. do some solo episodes. I'm going to have some incredible guests like mm. you. And we're just going to go put the right team together. We're just going to go consistently as, lo as long as it takes. Till right? you get it right. Till we get it right. That's right. Yeah. That's so right. That's no, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So, and no, but you know, you having you come on and I got to tell you, man, we got to, I, I, I'm going to definitely steal a little bit more of your time if I can, man. <laughs> yeah. You know that'd, be so, great. yeah that'd be great. Yeah. 45 minutes, an hour is not enough time. It's definitely not enough time, but yes. where can people find you on social media? How can people find you on sure, social they, media? They can find me on Dr. Lewis Ariaza on Instagram and on Facebook. Okay. Uh, my website is Dr. Lewis and Avelia, uh, Dr. Luis and Avelia. And, um, yeah, they can find me through that. Through awesome, that awesome. Well, Dr. Lewis, I thank you so much, brother, for taking the time to come yeah, out. It's my pleasure, right? man. And, you know, I know th there was a lot of value. I'm going to watch this with a notepad. <laughs> I, I was hoping that I had a notepad while you were saying certain things, man. So, and I'm definitely going to pick your brain some more. So I sure. appreciate you coming out, my brother. Sure, sure, sure. Appreciate no, and, and, and thank you. Thank you, JC, because um, I just want to leave you with one quote yes, that my, my mentor gave me a long time ago. He said, you never know how far reaching what you may say, think, or do today will affect the lives of millions tomorrow. Mm. It's better to light one candle than to curse the darkness. Get the big idea and all else will follow. And you, you just never know who is going to see or hear this. And they're on that point where do I or do I not? And, and your word, one word can radically change their, their fate. Yeah. One word can radically change the direction of their life and for that congratulations thank you my brother i appreciate that that means yeah. a lot yeah appreciate you brother all right guys catch you on the next one take care